May we begin with a brief prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear good and gracious God, I would like to thank you for the gift of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Bless everyone here tonight and their families, their loved ones, the diocese. Bless your church. Pour out the grace of an abundance. Lord, as we worship you, we praise you, and we give you glory. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> I'd like to begin the Old Testament, Psalm 22, 23. I will proclaim your name to my brethren, and in the assembly I will praise you, my Lord. We're all part of the church, and I love giving this witness to Christ because I am nothing, and he gives me my breath and my heartbeat. My goal is very simple. I want you, after you hear this, to focus on Christ and develop a very deep, meaningful relationship with your Lord and Savior. Get into the Bible, understand the Word of God, crave, grope for him. Because what is death? Death is nothing more than the assurance that you will meet God. Trust me. I think that's why St. Jerome and St. Francis of Assisi, who suffered a lot and died at a very young age, would always carry a skull with them. Everywhere they went, they placed the skull. Say, momenta more. Remember that you too must die. <clears throat> but I pray, God, that you'll understand that when you die, your existence continues. To this I will testify. You do not die. In fact, the next life is more beautiful than you can ever imagine. You're going to hear a story how Jesus demonstrated his love, his compassion, his mercy. When all human hope was gone. His mercy is unfathomable. And in my case, undeserved. I think that's why St. John recorded Jesus in the Last Supper. Jesus said, remember, apart from me, you can do nothing. How true. There's four themes I'd like you to kind of think about as you hear this. Let them coalesce in your soul and bring you hope, increase your faith. First theme is the Word of God. One of Jesus' names, Revelation 19.13. And I love St. John because St. John describes God in four terms. See, we're human. We live in the natural. We have five senses. So all we have is words to communicate our finite intellects. But John, St. John does a great job. God is spirit. God is light. God is love. And God is the Word made flesh. Jesus Christ, his name. The second theme I want you to focus on is <coughs> prayer. But a specific kind. There's lots of prayers. Prayers of petition, prayers of thanksgiving, prayers of supplication. Tonight, intercessory prayer. You see, I was dead. I couldn't pray anymore. Someone had to pick up the baton. Prayer matters. It changes everything. So listen to the theme of prayer, intercessory prayer. Because what did Jesus say? Again, in the Book of Glory in John's Gospel, Jesus said this in chapter 14. Whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, so that God the Father is glorified in the Son. Ask anything in my name, and I will do it promise from God. The third theme is divine mercy. I'm nothing more than a poster child for divine mercy. As Jesus said to, to Sister Faustina, Diary 723, the greater the sinner, the greater the right he has to my mercy. My mercy is confirmed in every work of my hands. 
And the last and most important theme, how your suffering is salvific to your own soul. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? But it's true. Suffering, to me, is the greatest form of prayer that I can give to my Lord. And we're going to get into that at the end. In fact, our suffering for Christ and joining it to his passion is the only way we can conjoin ourselves to the cross. And we all know at the cross, sin and death are both conquered. <clears throat> so I'm going to give you a brief bio on myself. Let me see more of that comment. I'm a real story of a very, very deep conversion, reversion, whatever you want to call it. And I believe the greatest conversions in life happen when God takes something from you. Because you're going to hear about a guy who had it all, but had nothing without Christ. So a brief bio on me. I was born in 1959. I was poorly catechized. Dad was Catholic. Mom was Protestant. Went to the Catholic Church. Was told, you've got to go to church, you're going to hell. That old guilt. And I'm a byproduct of getting caught between Vatican I and Vatican II. So I went from being a young boy with Latin to, what's this all about? Just shut up and go to church. I learned my love of the Bible from my maternal grandmother, Lillian. See, mom was a, um, she was a widow. Her husband died when my mom was four. She was an only child. So when dad married mom, grandma came along with the marriage. So we had grandma live with us all, our, all her life. And this woman would sit in her room and read the word. And she had such peace. Nothing bothered her. Thank you, Grandma Lillian, for the love of the word, because I love the Bible. <clears throat> Fourth grade, when you look back on your life, there are stepping stones. Don't overlook them. It's your staircase to heaven. I was in a public school, fourth grade, and a teacher asked me to stay after school, my math teacher, and I loved math. And she said, Paul, stay, I want to talk to you. So alone, she said to me, I see something special in you. The Lord's going to do great things someday with you. Are you born again of the Spirit? And I'm like, huh? She pulled out John chapter 3, and she read it to me in a public school, Buffalo, New York. She goes, here's a prayer card. Get on your knees tonight. Accept Jesus into your heart. You'll never live the same way. Beg him to be part of your life. I did that. Never told my parents. Foundation. A stranger affirmed me in Christ, as we should do as evangelists, affirming them in Christ. Little did I know, three years later, my mother would be stricken with cancer. And back then, it was breast cancer, so all they did was surgery. And after they removed her breast and metastasized throughout her body, they gave her three months to live. Mom was desperate to live. They told her to go home and get her affairs in order. Mom, in her desperation, went to a Catholic church, even though she wasn't Catholic. And she asked women to pray over her and lay hands on her. She came home and she said, I felt something go through me, like right through my core. I've been healed by the wounds of Christ. I will never go back to a doctor again. I will live by faith. Mom lived to 83 from age 41 and then died of cancer. Praise be Jesus Christ. And I took that, so that one of those women in the Catholic Church had the gift of healing. I took that healing for granted. I thought maybe God had divine providence for mom, loved mom, until it happened to me. But again, the word, if you're blessed, you're blessed to a thousand generations. And we've had priests look at this, it's unheard, not unheard of, but very rare that there'll be two miraculous healings, generation after generation. So I marry my childhood sweetheart, Beth. We have two children. We moved to Tucson from Buffalo in case mom died. So as soon as I got out of college, I go there. And you know, I was a naive young man. The Lord gave me some intellect. And, um, but I was lost. Absolutely lost. I wanted her to have the tougher job raising the kids, and I was going to go out into the big, bad work world. And so I had to work hard. I changed jobs right away to make more money. 
and uh, I just attacked the world. But I was lost. It was hard. See, everybody wanted a piece of the American pie, but the pie was only so big. And normally what I saw in the work world as a businessman was when my pie, share of the pie got bigger, someone else's got smaller. The pie's only so big. And it used to bother me, the ruthlessness of business. So <clears throat> I was lost, as I said, and I was 28 years old. I wish I had done this when I was 18. I drove up to the top of Mount Lemmon. I sat under a tree after mass one day, and I said, Lord, why, do I, why am I here? Why do I exist? Did you ever go through that? We all do. You ponder, what? why am I here? What am I supposed to do in my life? And I wrote a mission statement. It never said what I'd do for a living. It only said what my roles were as a husband, as a father, as a brother, as a son, to you, my community. It never said what I would do for a living. The only thing financial it said is, I will be debt free at age 40. And my father never made more than $18,000 a year in his life. We were very poor middle class. But I read the word, and the word said, the borrower is slave to the lender. The Bible's very clear about debt. So that's the only thing it said about what I, how, what I was, how I was supposed to live financially. We'll come back to the mission statement. It's in the back of the book. A lot of people in high school and young people really focus on that. So I get into my 30s and 40s, and I'm rocking and rolling, man. Everything I touch turns to gold financially. Businesses I start, companies I run. Did a lot of philanthropical work for boards, specifically helping young children, my way of giving back to my Lord for our healthy children. So whatever I did, I would love to help people. But I had this burning desire to get out of the world. I really did. I couldn't stand the business world. So my goal was I'm going to go be successful, make a lot of money, and just walk out right off into the sunset and enjoy the rest of my life. Things were going really well, as far as the world's concerned. Three things happened to me at age 40, and the number 40, right? Test the trial. 40 days temptation, 40 days in the desert. Three things happened to me, boom, boom, boom. First, my dad, my best friend, dies, so unexpectedly. He looked perfectly normal. The doctor goes, he's not normal, he's be, he'll be dead in three and a half months. Sure enough, he was. I had to process my lifetime with my old man. And my only brother gets hit by a car. The surgeon says, I have to operate on him right now or he's dead. He was riding a bicycle. He survived the surgery, he's a complete paraplegic. He suffers a lot. And then I bought a business off a guy for a lot of money. It was a personal service business tied to him. And he dies and I have to pay the widow, which I did. And I'm like, man, everything's changing. People are dying. But Paul, nothing happened to Paul. He just kept going, kept going. You see, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I had everything as far as the world defines success. Houses, cars, beautiful family, country clubs, Everybody wanted to be around the Zuccarellis. We don't have a lot of friends anymore. Because I found, I learned a painful lesson. When I was a CEO of companies and people asked me to do stuff for them, they didn't love me. They loved what, the position I had, what I could do for them. Very few people even call us. <clears throat> because they say, oh, the Zuccarellis are Jesus freaks. They're Jesus freaks now. It's okay. We're not of this world. But I must tell you, looking back, I was a perfectionist. See, I'm an analytic, I had to get everything right. So it's like a batting average. I won more than I lost, I hit the ball more often, because I wouldn't make a business decision unless the facts supported it. I kept emotion out of all of business decisions. Looking back, though, as I said, I'd become too independent. It's a form of vanity, pride. Self-sufficiency is pride. Success defined me, and I enjoyed the affirmation of my success. Two
two scripture passages that define the old Paul. The first is the sower and the seed. We all know the sower is God and the seed is the word, Jesus. And Jesus explains the parable and there's, puts people in one of four categories. And my brothers and friends, you, sisters, you need to get to the fourth category. You've got to get to the fourth category. And you know the first category falls on the pathway and the devil snatches it, doesn't root at all. Second type of person, the word is in you. But when trials and persecutions and the difficulty in this life comes, you walk away because the soil's barren and rocky. I was the guy in the third category. I loved the word I used to read. I still do. I read the Bible a lot. Okay. The word was in me. <clears throat> but what does Jesus say? The allure of riches and the anxiety of this life choke you. You won't produce fruit. I wasn't producing fruit. And Jesus said, you have to get to the fourth category where the word is in you and it roots and it produces fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. That's us in the kingdom of heaven on earth. On earth as it is in heaven, we have to produce fruit. The second example of Paul, the old Paul, was, oh, this one tears my heart out. What Jesus said to the church at Laodicea in chapter 3, because I'd become a lukewarm Catholic. I was so busy with work, it was like a hamster on a wheel. 40 hours a week became 50, became 60, became 70. <clears throat> Choking out my faith. And what did Jesus say? So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. For you say you are rich and affluent and no need of anything. But yet you do not realize that you're pitiable, poor, blind, wretched, and naked. Repent. Those whom I love, I will reprove and chastise. Return to me. So as I said, in my late 40s, I witnessed a lot of suffering in other people's lives, but not our lives. Then my heart started going in and out of rhythm. So I have an atrial fib on and off. And they told me it was stress. I had a lot going on, you know. But my mitral valve was leaking, but a lot of people have mitral valve prolapse. You're going to be fine, blah, blah, blah. So I continued to just go into the world. And when the heart wouldn't come back on its own through medication, I'd go to the hospital and they'd put me out and they would give me a quick zap of electricity and my heart would come back to rhythm and I'd walk right out those big doors of the hospital and I went right into the big bad world. In my early mid-50s, more, more success, more AFib. Again, I wasn't necessarily building bigger barns. I was saving proceeds to get out of the world. Many of the plans of a man's heart. But it's the Lord's will that prevails. In my mid-50s, kids are married, they're gone. I'm talking to Beth, and I began taking her to near-death experience movies. I began reading books from the neurosurgeons, the cardiologists. Drive her nuts. She go, why are you infatuated on this stuff? I said, I want to know. People have seen heaven, they've seen hell, they've seen purgatory. Again, the thirst for knowledge, I want to know. Little did I know, little did we know. Again, part of the spiritual foundation. I was being prepared for something. My life now makes perfect sense. <clears throat> as I said, so I was, as I was preparing for this comfortable life, I got sicker and sicker to the point where I was short of breath, couldn't breathe. And on December 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception on 2016, I went to see my cardiologist in Tucson. I said, Doc, I don't feel good. And he said, your valve's leaking pretty bad, but don't worry, you're going to die some loss. Here's some medicine. Go home and live your life. I get in the car at about 4 o'clock after that appointment, and a voice as clear as day, but it wasn't audible, was spoken right through me. Picture your mind being blank like a slate, and somebody just talks right through your head. This voice says, get to the mayo now, it's the valve. I was like, that's real. I get home. <clears throat> By the way, I didn't know what a locution was, so it scared me. Until I read St. Teresa of Avila's book, The Interior Castle. She explains them brilliantly. Anyway, I get home and I call the Mayo and they said, we're six months out for an appointment up here in Phoenix. I said, look, I need a second opinion right away. The lady goes, hmm, I'm in schedule here and an appointment just freed up. The last one before Christmas in two weeks. Can you get up here? Sure. 
I go up there, the doctor had all my charts and records, and he sits me down and he goes, I'm just telling you, you have classic symptoms of mitral valve failure. You're going to need open heart surgery within two years. Go home and don't do anything strenuous. You're going to know within two years. Okay? So I go home, and he goes, if you go into AFib coma. So I drive back to Tucson from Phoenix, and sure enough, January, February, I start having AFib again. He goes, get up here. He runs a specialized test down my throat through a transesophageal echo, and he says, I couldn't see it from the outside. <clears throat> you have mitral jets. You have less than half the blood going through your body. The other half squirting straight up into your atrium. You're like in heart failure. You got to go see the surgeon. The earliest the guy that can help you here is 13 days out. Go home and don't do anything strenuous. So I went from your fine to your heart failure. So as I'm driving home with my wife, again, the Lord says, read the word. Highlight when I move you. You will need this. Oh, it's so real, my brothers and sisters. I love the word. That made sense. So I'm trying to figure out, how am I going to read the Bible in 13 days? I know. I'll read Psalms that Jesus quotes the most. I'll read Proverbs. I love it. And I'll read the New Testament. I could probably get that in. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I'm not embarrassed to tell you this. When I started reading the Bible, Psalm 51, prayer of repentance of the sinner. Psalm 91, prayer of man in distress for protection. Psalm 139, I kept coming back to 139. He knows me, he loves me, he knit me in my mother's womb before time. He knew I would be here tonight. He knew you would be here tonight. I don't need to even think about what I'm going to say. He knows. So I'm trying to finish the Bible, and I, his locutions are over and over again. The Lord kept saying to me, I suffered for you, Paul. You will suffer for me, but I will be with you over and over and over. And I'm bawling. And Beth would walk in and go, why are you crying reading your Bible? You love the Bible. I said, there's something going to happen to me. She goes, stop it, you're just being anxious. I said, no. So I go and I meet the surgeon, 13 days, and I'm about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. A little knock on the door. <clears throat> Never met the man in my life. He introduces himself. He goes, I'm going to cut to the chase. Your valve's shot. I can't fix it. Be prepared to come out with a metal valve in your chest. I said, you know, Doc, that's not what I wanted to hear today. Comorbidities, life expectancy. So I know, I'm being honest with you. And I remember my mother, this is where kind of all of a sudden the new creation comes in. My mother passed away. The blood. The blood of the cross, Paul. Whenever you need something, one drop of his blood can heal the world. And I look at this total stranger doctor and I said, Doctor, give me your hands. He said, what? He said, let me see your hands. I need to pray over your hands. I said, Lord, you brought me to this man in this hour of my life. He's a complete stranger. Grant him the patience and the precision and the gift of healing that you've given him in his hands. As I call on the blood of Jesus Christ to give him that gift of healing of my valve, repairing it through the blood of the cross. He said, thank you. I'll do the best I can. <clears throat> I'm off next week, but I'm going to come in on Friday, you're my only patient. Be here at 5.30 a.m. next Friday. You've got 10 days. You'll be fine. Just go home. Don't do anything strenuous. And I leave. See, my brothers and sisters in Christ, I was the type of guy that I could tell you exactly what happened in the Bible. I'm one of those analytics. But I never got why. Why they happened. As then I'm finishing the Bible, I'm being led to the cross. Everything I'm reading it deals with the crucifixion. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I couldn't fathom the love of God. I couldn't, I couldn't understand how God would love me that much. And I slowly but surely in 10 days began to recognize and understand the only way for me to get to heaven was to die. And it was this internal battle between the self, the will of self, and his will for myself. 
and they were completely different. And that was a struggle for me. Because I suffered for you, Paul, you're going to suffer for me. And I slowly began to come to the conclusion that this thing called faith is an all-in proposition. It's my last bet. And that 99%, not hope. See, I used to think I was Catholic, so that was good, right? I was inoculated, I was baptized. I'm good. Went to church when I could, gave a little money. Oh no. No. Not good enough. I used to think getting to heaven was an entrance exam. You're about to hear about it. No. It's an exit interview. I couldn't even present my case. So here I am. My heart telling me that imminent suffering awaits me. So the Sunday before surgery, <clears throat> we go to Mass and I'm sitting there I'm thinking, this could be my last Mass. There's a Sacred Heart of Jesus statue at the right side of the altar and I said to Beth, let everybody leave. I want to be here long. I'm looking around going, how much of my time did I spend on the salvation of my soul versus the world? And I went up and I put my heart on Jesus' heart and I said, you got to help me. I'm having heart surgery. Paula, you're going to suffer for me, but I'll be with you. There's always that last part, I'll be with you. So that afternoon, I'm five days out from surgery on Sunday. At, five, at two o'clock, the Lord says, go for a ride the car alone. I told Beth, I need to get out of the house. She goes, you're not allowed to drive. I said, I just need to get out of the house. I said, Lord, where do you want me to go? Go to Santa Catalina Church, there you'll find me. I've driven by that church a thousand times. Never went there, never went. That day I drove in the parking lot. It's right up against the base of the mountain, it's beautiful. Church is locked. I'm the only car in the parking lot. Lord, what do you want me to do? Beautiful statue of our Blessed Mother. And I remember Isaiah 30, 41. The voice behind you will whisper in your ear, this is the way, walk in it. And I look down, there's a dirt path around Mary's statue to the back of the church. And I hear this, walk in it. And I walk around the back of the church and there's the Garden of Gethsemane and the stations and me and Jesus. I had my Holy Thursday and my Friday, my Good Friday. I'm laying on the figurine of Christ, trying to remember what Matthew said or wrote. I just said, Lord, not my will be done but yours, but please, if you could take this cup. Paul, I suffered for you, you will suffer for me. I am convinced I'm gonna die. I drive home, Beth goes, where were you? You're gone a long time, that's what I was praying. See, this was my cross. No sense worrying her. Monday morning, I'm dialing for dollars. Calling everybody I know in business in Dallas, Detroit, Chicago. Hey, Paul, I haven't talked to you in six months. I said, I don't have time. I'm calling her, pray for me. 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 Okay, I'm trying to get prayer going. Beth sees me struggling. She, Wednesday, she says, get in the car. She drives me down to a Christian bookstore. She buys me the crucifix from the book of Proverbs. Many of the women of proven worth, but you surpassed them all, Beth. Thank you for the gift of the cross. The cross is about to journey, my brothers and sisters. It's about now to journey. See, all these things that we thought were coincidences in our lives, they were Christ incidences. There are no coincidences. The cross will now journey. I call the priest, anoint me with oils. I remembered that somewhere, poor catechized kid. When you go into the mail, Thursday afternoon, come here for Thursday mass, I'll do it after mass. I get anointed. I go home, I go into my big office, my I love me room. All the accolades, all the awards, all the sports memorabilia. Meaningless. Absolutely meaningless. I'm trying to pay all the bills for Beth. Life insurance. Homeowners. Car insurance. And I open the left drawer of my desk and there it is. 
the mission statement that I wrote 30 years ago as a young man. And I read it. And I wept. I thought, it's finished. I did the best I could. The Lord is my witness. I took a pen out, my brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the corner it says, date of death. And I began to write tomorrow's date. And I stopped and I said, I'm sorry. You're the potter. I'm just the clay. I have no right to do that. Instead, I wrote a note on it. Because I'm bawling on this mission statement. It says, please give a copy of this to my children and grandchildren so they know who I was and who I am. I wrote it past tense. I'm dead. In future tense, current tense. I'm alive. I am in Christ. I turned it over. I said, Beth, promise me if I die tomorrow, you're going to give the life insurance proceeds to the Catholic Church. I don't have time to change the beneficiary. She said, okay. Because I remember reading St. Raphael in Tobit chapter 12. Prayer and fasting are for righteousness. But almsgiving saves from death, eternal death. And I said, promise me you'll do that. She said, okay. Come on, we got to go. So I went in for surgery with my Bible and this crucifix in a plastic bag underneath my pillow. And I said to the staff, may I pray? Said, sure. I prayed Romans 5, 3 through 5. It's a perfect prayer for me. I'm having heart surgery. Where Paul said, rejoice in your afflictions. Rejoice. Because affliction will produce endurance, and endurance proven character. And proven character will give you hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out into your heart through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Having heart surgery, he loves my heart, he loves me. I have the Holy Spirit. I have hope. Because I finally got there, my brothers and sisters. I had surrendered. I had to fully trust the love of God, the faith in my Lord Jesus Christ, and a power beyond my comprehension, the Spirit. And I went out. <clears throat> As St. Augustine said, faith is to believe what you do not see. The goal of this faith is to see what you believe. So I come to five hours later, and the doctor goes, hey, I was in there five hours working on your heart. You're good. You're good. You're good to go. You'll be out in six days. They extubate me, and they send me up to the ICU. And I'm all wired up in telemetry. About 24 hours later on Saturday, Beth's out having lunch with David because the medical profession said I'm fine. <laughs> All of a sudden I look at my sister and I said, Donna, get the nurse right now, please. Give me help. What? I go, there's something wrong with me. What? I said, I'm burning. My whole body's on fire. Help me. The nurse came in. She looked at the whole telemetry. She said, he's fine. He's all normal. She took two steps outside the room and I suffered from what's known as sudden cardiac death. Heart stop. Cardiac arrest. I just, you die in an instant. So <clears throat> I know this is, my sister stuck, went off to the corner, in come the crash team, and she starts praying. No weapon formed against Paul shall prevail, Isaiah. He who began a good work in Paul will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ, Philippians. She prayed the fourth cup Halil prayer. She's not Jewish. She didn't even know what she was praying. Okay. The fourth cup, the vinegar on the cross. I shall not die but live to proclaim the deeds of the Lord. Chastise him severely, Lord, but don't turn him over to death. Well, I know this is why you came here tonight. I'm going to say a couple things before I tell you what the beatific vision was for me. First of all, what I'm going to share with you is a private revelation. It adds nothing to the deposit of our faith. That ended with the apostles. Number two, ground rule. No human being can adequately define heaven or God. Why do I say that? As I said earlier, I have a finite intellect. There's no words I could ever put 
on an infinite God in heaven. I think that's why St. Paul, would, what St. Paul wrote in the Gospel is literal truth. If you recall, and those of you who know the Bible, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 12, he writes, I once knew a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. I was caught up in the third heavens. He's writing about himself in the third person. And he says this, I witnessed and heard ineffable things that no man can utter. He is absolutely correct in that statement. The word ineffable, beyond comprehension, inability to put words on it. St. Paul nailed that sentence. So I will use words in Paul Zuccarelli's finite head to convey what, I, what happened. When I died, my soul leaves my body, separates. And the Lord let me look back on my body briefly, and I recognized myself. But I had no concern of the body. Total peace. And then this glorious white light comes. Some people say there's a tunnel. Mine was just this round, radiant white light. It was so bright. In fact, you know, you go outside and you look at the sun, you'll melt your retinas 92 million miles away. I could look at this light. I had no retinas. And it was beckoning me. It was calling me. Now, I'm going to speak metaphysically because I didn't have a resurrected body. I can't tell you if I was moving forward into the light or it was pulling me. So think of gravity or front-wheel drive. I couldn't tell. The word I would use is absorption. And beckoning, I get this. And I just go. I go into this light. And my brothers and sisters in Christ, when I get to heaven, this radiant white light just envelops me. I use the word holding me. There's an ardor of affection that is indescribable. I fell down and I worship God in spirit. I knew exactly where I was. I knew I was the creature. He was the creator. When your soul is in union with your creator, you will know truth and love because God is love. My intellect and my will still existed but it was heightened beyond comprehension. I was more alive there than I was any time in my life here, even to all the joyfulness here. Other attributes I would give you in words are, there's no space and time there. I couldn't tell you if I was there a minute or a thousand years. I just wanted to stay. Again, St. Paul said this, he nails it. Then shall I know fully as I am fully known. True. He says, but now we see as in a mirror. And back then the mirror were mica rocks. Can you imagine looking at yourself in a piece of mica rock? It looked pretty disordered. Oh, the Lord graced me with showing me my conscience. Everything I did that offended him all the way back. I saw all my sins that offended him. He said, you have to go back. Within a second, my eyes pop open and the doctors are screaming at me, say something, say something. I look around and I go, used 150 jewels on me, Dr. Dinya. Who is this guy? And they interviewed me, it's in the book. They said, you were talking to us when you were dead. We've never seen anything like this in our life. And they said, they wrote in my chart, patient has lost sinus rhythm, junctional rhythm, probable cause, some endocardial injury during surgery. They don't tell the family. They said, leave him, he's, he's, he's back. His heart isn't right, just leave him alone, rest him. So, more proof of heaven. St. John writes, remember, God is spirit, love, light, and the word. He writes, what he declared to us, we proclaim to you, God is light. Or a creed, God from God, light from light. Or Jesus, I am the light of the world. The one who follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of eternal life. Our Eucharistic prayer. <clears throat> Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection. And all those who died in your mercy, welcome them into the light of your face. So the family's thinking, the doctors didn't tell him, he said, he's, he's back, he's good, he's good, he's back, he's back. 
the Lord wasn't done manifesting himself. The next day was Pentecost Sunday. At 8.49 a.m., my wife Beth and our son Dave was at the foot of the bed with my sister, and I die again. Heart stop. And again, and again, and again. I will suffer eight cardiac arrests. I will be dead for approximately two hours. When finally, the head of the ICU and the chaplain come in and tell the family we're sorry. What he has is fatal. He's lost the electrical connection to his heart. The only treatment is electrocution, and it's inhumane to do this to a human being. We're sorry you had to watch it. I thank Jesus Christ because I know he's real. Enter the Holy Spirit. Pentecost. What did Jesus say in the story of Lazarus? This sickness will not end in death. No, it's for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And before Christ said, Lazarus, come out, he said this. Did I not tell you that if you believe, meaning faith, you will see the glory of God? So when all hope in the natural now is over, treatment stopped, the Holy Spirit moves our 34-year-old son, Michael, another locution, Go into the dad's room and take the last thing you have with us to your father. The cross that Beth bought four days earlier. It's about to travel again. Michael takes the cross. He's told to get to St. Paul's Church now. Leave. Most family members who had a loved one just dying or dead <clears throat> wouldn't leave. Thanks be to God he listened to the Spirit. He said, well, St. Paul's, I don't even know where it is, but my dad's name is Paul. To this day, he said, I didn't even know how I got there. He walked into St. Paul's Church and there was a confirmation and a communion going on. He, respected, he walked right in at the Eucharist time. He got the Eucharist and he went outside. He's waiting for those doors to open. As soon as they open, he runs back in and he grabs someone and says, hey, I need to see that priest right now. Sir, that's not a priest. That's Bishop Thomas Olmstead. Bishop Olmstead came out. Michael was hysterical fell at his feet and lifted up the cross. He said, please, this is my father's. He's dead or dying. I don't know. Something happened. He's a good man. Please pray for him. Help him. Bishop Bowen said later, told our family, your son's faith saved your life. I've never seen faith like that. He's begging me like the Roman centurion. Your son's faith moved my heart so much, Paul. I fell on my knees with him and I said, Michael, Jesus said, where two or more are gathered in my name, there I will be in their midst. We prayed for you. Your son's heart moved my heart so much, I drove back to my private chapel. During my vespers all afternoon and evening, I prayed for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal you in the name of Jesus Christ. Prayer matter. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the surgeon's feeling responsible. So he calls the head of the electrophysiology department, Dr. Shervatsen, to come in. He came in on a Sunday. Shervatsen later said, hey, when I walked in, I saw this guy's been dead nine times. He's been dead. I can't help this guy. He said, the only thing I could do is give him rest. There's no treatment. He said to Beth, I can't treat him. I can rest him. Signed this form, and they took my body away. He quickly sewed a pacemaker generator in the side of my neck and ran a wire down my juggler in my atrium. Went up my groin <clears throat> with a screw and lead into my atrium. He's going to try to beat my body externally, beat my heart rather, externally out of the box outside my neck. He later showed us the chart. It says, sheath place through atrium, blah, 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 blah. Cannot proceed with interrogating the device. Because the last piece of the procedure is to go up underneath my left clavicle in my brainstem and kill my heart and lungs, my ganglion nerve your autonomous bodily function nerve. Just the left side is heart and lungs. That's why you breathe and your heart beats at night while you sleep. He shows the chart and says, cannot proceed with interrogating the device. Patient does not have a heartbeat. Paul, that wire's there, but if it isn't perfectly gonna override a heartbeat, you're never coming back. So I 
I need heartbeat to test the wire. The next sentence in my chart, praise be Jesus Christ, says, patient's heart returns to spontaneous sinus rhythm on its own. We're standing around, you know, your heart came back on its own. And I screamed, test the wire. It overrode your heartbeat. I quickly took a six inch needle and went up into your brain, I killed you. I worked on you with medication. I got your heart going again with the generator. You're in a coma. I told your wife, look, he's alive by the box in his neck. In, in two days, I shut the wire off. If his heart stops again, we leave the man. We don't, he's dead. If this man lives, he's most likely gonna be neurologically impaired, maybe even a vegetable. He's been dead too long without oxygen to his brain on and off. Again, all praise be to my Lord Jesus Christ. Two days later, I'm walking around the ICU, praying over people, a new man in Christ, a new creation, watching people die, ministering to their family, watching young people in the ICU struggle to live. And I asked for the cross back. I said, where's my cross? And the Lord told me, thank your son Michael for his actionable faith. The prayers were heard. Michael never told anyone what he did. I got the cross back. I wrapped it around my wrist. And I just stared at it. As a human being, I'm trying to process this. This is beyond my comprehension. And I'm thinking of Job. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh. Blessed be the Lord. And I'm thinking, my heart could stop like the next second. I could stop breathing again. He's all I have. As St. Teresa of Avila said, three words, God is enough. From the Psalmist 5015, call on me in the day of trouble, and I will rescue you, and you will honor me. Amen. You know, you're more blessed than I am, because remember the famous saying when, Je when Thomas doubts, he wasn't in the room, and all of a sudden Jesus appears again, and he says, put your hands here. Thomas falls down and says, my Lord and my God. Everybody remembers that, and they stop. The next two verses are very powerful. Jesus says to Thomas, doubt no longer and believe. Then he gives a beatitude. Thomas, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are you who have not seen and believe. You're more blessed than I am. So, again, I'm trying to process this, and there's my family. I realized I didn't tell them I loved them enough. I didn't work hard enough for them. I could have done so much more for my family, for my friends, for my loved ones. The two prayers, I'm gonna get personal again, two prayers I prayed before I went into surgery, as I told you, the first one was, your will be done. I got there, surrender. And I said, Lord, whatever has to happen to me may lead my family back to Christ and the church. Many of our family members have left the faith. I said, Lord, whatever has to happen, bring them back. My second prayer, you can't negotiate with God. I said, Lord, I want to live. I said, Lord, if you let me live, I promise I will quit the world. I will walk from everything. Because I'd read Matthew 9, 36, 37, 38, where the Lord said, the abundance is great, but the laborers are few. Ask the master of the harvest to be sent into the labor field. And I, I, I was like, wait a minute, it says you have to ask. Ask, that's an action verb. I have to ask him, he's not just gonna send me. I said, Lord, I'm asking. If you let me live, I'll make a covenant with you. I will quit everything. And I'll go into the harvest field for you. And I prayed that I dedicated my children, my grandchildren, all of my future prog progeny that I don't even know. I just prayed and dedicated them to Christ. Be careful what you pray for. It comes true. He answers prayer. So I had a second procedure done. They wanted to put a pacemaker defibrillator in me. I said, no, no, no. If I die, it's good. It's good. It's all good. I want to go home. I want to go home. I didn't want to... And the kids go, oh, Dad, come on. So I agree to it, and they say, we just discussed you in grand rounds of Mayo. No one wants to go in your valve again. You've got to drop the wire through the valve for your pacemaker defibrillator. So the guy comes in, the Dr. Shervatsun, who did the left stellate ganglion nerve block in my brainstem. 
and he says, uh, I could try to put the wires from your defibrillator through your coronary sinus vein and lay them underneath your heart if your veins are wide enough. That's option one. Option two is, I've only done that 23 times. Option two is, I drop it through the valve. Option three is, I abandon the procedure, go home with nothing. What do you want me to do? <laughs> Again, I'm pretty beat up. And I go, I'll pray for you. Trust. So I said, can I please take Jesus with me in this procedure? Sure. Wrapped him around my wrist again, went in. I come to and the nurse says, I hear the doctor go, say something. And I go, my crucifix. The doctor goes, what did he say? The nurse goes, I think he said crucifix. And I'm like, ah, I'm going like this. My first conscious thought is, where's Christ? He wasn't in my right hand. And the nurse goes, oh, I'm sorry. He fell on the floor during the procedure. Picked it up, gave it to me. The Lord has blessed and confirmed and affirmed us so much. I was given my witness once in Phoenix. After the witness, a lady said to me, she goes, Hi. I was the nurse in Mayo that picked up the cross. I was everything you wrote in that book happened. I was there. I'm really happy you're doing this. You're increasing the faith in the hospital. Anyway, so I'm about to go home. After 12 days of being through the crucible, tested by fire. And I'm trying to process this. And I remember getting, I wasn't angry at God. I just said, Lord, why? Was I that bad of a person? Why did my family have to watch this? What did I do that was so wrong? I was shaming myself. And then I caught myself and I realized that's the enemy renting space in my head. He's trying to rent space up here. And I apologized to God again. I said, you are the potter, you're the potter, I'm just the clay. I'm sorry. So I learned five lessons from this, and then we'll get Beth up here for 10 minutes, and then we'll do Q&A. Thank you. First lesson I learned, your life's a gift from God. Your purpose is to do God's will, not your own. So I work on the virtue of mortification. The virtue is prudence, that I make right decisions in God's will. But the gift is counsel. The spiritual gift is counsel. So I pray for the gift of counsel that I will be able to discern God's will in all things. And as I work on dying to self, where my identity is more in Christ, I get a secondary benefit. I become more humble. I did quit everything. People thought I was nuts. You could have made a ton of money the rest of your life. So what? Knowing that I'm gonna die again, and knowing that my life will continue, the only thing I worry about, brothers and sisters in Christ, location, location, location. Those of you in real estate, understand. <clears throat> St. Faustina wrote in her diary, 1434, today my will no longer exists, and she drew a line through it. And I just try to focus on that. Second thing I learned from this, faith grows in relationships. Okay, I used to worry about getting to heaven. No, my, my only job is to get me, my family, and you to the cross. God will take it from there. I think I've learned that we're just journeying through this life as pilgrims. This is not your home. If I had to put one word on where I was in heaven, it's home. I was home, where I belong, where I was meant to be. St. Peter said, well, you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. How much more direct can you be? That's the goal. Third lesson I learned is, as I said this over and over again, prayer matters to God. Prayer changes everything. For my prayer life now, it's different. I get on my knees like a little kid. In the morning, I get up and I kiss the, cross, kiss the crucifix. I thank him for the day. I tell him to send me. When I go home at night before I go to bed, I got a one out of three chance of dying in my sleep. I get on my knees and I thank him. My prayer life is very different. I don't talk much anymore. He knows what I'm gonna say before I say it. I meditate on the cross and the passion. Here's a verse from Sirach 736 that's etched on my heart. I shared it with Bishop Olmsted, and he said, that's one of my favorites. 
In all you do, remember your last days, and you will never sin. Repeat. In all you do, remember your last days, you will never sin. Doesn't say you might not sin, you shall not sin, you probably won't sin. Never. Think about that. If you knew you were going to drive out of here tonight and get in a car accident and die in two hours, you'd stop sinning. If you knew two months from now you'd be diagnosed with a terminal disease and be dead in a week, you'd stop sinning. Just take it out six months, a year. You do not know when the Lord will call you. I think that's why the book of Ecclesiastes says, better the day of your death than the day of your life, the day of your birth, rather. Fourth lesson I learned is focus on your soul and feed it with the word. I didn't spend a lot of time on the salvation of my soul. I think if more you understand the Bible, you're going to crave a personal relationship with Jesus. And in the Catholic Church, help your priests. Praise and worship God for the sacraments. I've gotten a real education of how much time and how hard it is to be a priest with the sacraments. Okay. Sacraments imbue grace permanently in your soul. I didn't understand that. There's ordinary grace and it comes and goes like the wind. That's the spirit. But there's permanent grace in your soul. Help your priests. Last thing I learned is I'll end with this is our suffering leads to our salvation. This is how I rationalize it. It's the paradox of the cross. For God so loved the world he gave. He gave his son. So if God loved me that much to do that for me on the cross, suffer like that, then love and suffering are inseparable. I think Venerable Fulton Sheen said it brilliantly. Pick up a crucifix and stare at it. It's your autobiography of your life. Every human being, that's your autobiography. You'll accept it for your own salvation, or you'll reject it for your own condemnation. It's really that simple. I'll end with St. Paul. For I have resolved now to know nothing while I was with you, except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For me, the Gospel of James, the last two lines echo with our ministry. Last two lines in James' Gospel, he writes, if anyone, that's you and me, brothers and sisters, can bring a sinner back from his ways to the cross, you will cover over a multitude of your own sins and save your own soul. One. We're all evangelists. Remember, my brothers and sisters in Christ, you must choose heaven and earth. You must choose Christ. Beth, come on up. Thank you. Can you hold it? I'll just hold it. Okay. Hi. I'm Beth. You have to remember, Paul was the CEO. I'm mom, so be patient with me. Um, my part of the story on that weekend starts on that Saturday. And I wasn't there when Paul had his first cardiac arrest because I was out to lunch with David. So my sister-in-law witnessed it. And she texted me, and she told me that Paul had a cardiac arrest. So, of course, I called her, and she said, yes, he had a cardiac arrest. They had already, David dropped me off at the front door of the Mayo Clinic. By the time I got up to the ICU room floor, they had already cardioverted him, so I didn't have to see anything. But my poor sister-in-law, she looked awful. So I informed the family that I was not going to go and spend the night in the hotel room because we were still living in Tucson, so I, had, I was staying in a Marriott that's right in front of the Mayo Clinic. 
So I told the family I wasn't going to spend the night in the hotel room or in the, in the hotel room. I wanted to spend the night in his room. So I had this staff bringing me in one of those lovely recliners and I spent the night with Paul. And he actually did well that night. He was getting checked all night long, but he actually did quite well. Our son David was also living in Tucson at the time. So I asked him to spend the night in my hotel room so that when he could come over to the hospital really early in the morning when the doctors did their rounds, because I wanted that extra set of ears. So when the doctors told me what happened, he would be there. So he agreed. So on that Sunday morning, it was myself and David and his sister. And he seemed to be doing well. He had ordered breakfast. When all of a sudden, his eyes rolled back in his head. The alarms went off. The crash teams came in. And I looked over at my sister-in-law and I said, Donna, you don't have to do this again. Just go out in the reading room and pray. I pulled back David and we stood outside the doors and we watched. My son David was my rock that day because he sat there and he watched the telemetry. So every time Paul had a cardiac arrest and they had cardio him back, he'd say, Mom, Mom, they got him back, they got him back, he's back. But then he'd have another cardiac arrest. It was sometime between the second and third or third and fourth cardiac arrest when I looked at David and I said, David, please text your brother and make sure Michael gets here. Because I didn't think Michael was ever going to see Paul alive again. So he texted him and thankfully he was on his way to the hospital. So before long he was coming through the ICU room doors and I said to him, go to the head of the bed and tell dad you're here. And he did. He walked in, he went up to the head of the bed. He said, Dad, I'm here. I love you. And right there in front of Michael, Paul had a cardiac arrest. And there is my son, completely shaking. He's in complete emotional and physical shock. He couldn't even stand up anymore. The staff and the nurses had to bring us chairs to sit on. So we were all outside the room again and we continued to watch for probably another half hour. And I could tell by the look on the doctor's faces that things weren't going well. And I knew they were gonna come out and talk to me. And they did. The head of ICU came out first and said that we can't do anything more for Paul. We can't cardio avert him anymore, it's inhumane. If anything can be done, Dr. Shervatsen is going to try something. So Dr. Shervatsen came out and said, I have no idea what I'm going to try, but I'm going to try it. To take him down to the cath lab and do a procedure. I need to give his heart rest. That's all I can think of doing. Sign these papers. And I did. They wheeled Paul out, and he was gone. That is when Michael went back into his room and grabbed that crucifix off the whiteboard that was hanging on the whiteboard in there. And I saw Michael go in the room, but I thought he went back in for his backpack or his water bottle or whatever. Never saw him take the crucifix. We were in the elevator going down to the lobby, and Michael says to me, Mom, I'm leaving this hospital. And I said, where do you think you're going? He said, Mom, I need to find a church. And I said, honey, there is a chapel downstairs. We'll go in the chapel, we'll all be together, and we'll pray. And he looked at me with a look I will never forget. He said, no, Mom, I need to find a church. I knew there was no stopping him. So we got down to the lobby, and I walked my son to the front doors of the Mayo Clinic. Knowing his, he was in no condition to drive, and I watched him walk across the parking lot, and he was gone. And I looked up to God, 
And I said, God, he's in your hands. I can't protect him anymore. And I came back inside the lobby. And David and Donna and I, we were texting people. We were asking for prayer for everybody. Fast forward the day. Paul finally comes back to the ICU room. And he's now got a pacemaker in the side of his neck. And he's reintubated. But he's alive. They explained to me kind of what they did. They said that they were going to start weaning him off the drugs the next day and see what kind of condition he was going to be in. So I told the family I was going to spend the night in ICU again. So I spent the night with Paul again. The next morning they start weaning him off the drugs. And uh, he seemed to be doing fine once they extubated him. And he was talking and he was answering their questions. So I knew my type A husband was still there. So I didn't think there was any neurological damage. So he seemed to be doing well. So I said to David, our son, I said, David, if you wouldn't mind, I haven't been back to the hotel now in two and a half days. I'm just gonna go over and take a quick shower. Then I'll come back and I'm gonna spend the night with dad again. He said, no problem, mom, go, go, go. You go and rest, go sleep. And I said, no, 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 I'm just gonna take a quick shower and I'll be back. And I left. I went over to that hotel room and when I walked in that room, it was the first time I was alone since all this has happened. And you moms, you know you cry differently when you're alone. I walked in that room and I completely broke down. I did not have to be strong for my boys anymore. And I just wept. And I cried so hard and I prayed. I went over to the window and I looked up to God again. And I said, God, what is happening to my family? What is going to happen to my family? And I continued to pray. Eventually I said to myself, I do need to get in that shower. So I walked into the bedroom, and just out of pure exhaustion, I threw myself on the bed. The last thing I remember was this instantaneous thought of our son David. Then I saw an image of a black cell phone. And on the cell phone, it said, come back. The next thing that happened to me, I felt this wind go right through my core. And I was out. I woke up 40 minutes later, completely rested, like I had slept 10 hours, and I was in complete peace. And I knew everything was going to be okay. Now, I'm a cradle Catholic that went 12 years to, to Catholic school. And if those nuns taught you anything, it was the, the Holy Spirit was the wind. So the charismatic movement was coming alive when Paul's mom got prayed over. We knew about the charismatic movement, but we never really got involved with it. So I had never seen or witnessed anything with the Holy Spirit or anything. But I knew I needed to discern this. So, fast forward our life. We put our house in Tucson on the market. We move up to Phoenix. And through Bishop Olmsted's providence, we get introduced to the Franciscan Friars of the Holy Spirit. Charismatic Franciscans who pray over people, do healing masses, and we start witnessing some true miracles. So I knew that if I was going to discern this with anybody, I was going to discern it with one of these priests. And I was able to. So Paul had given his witness at one point, and I said, okay, I'm going to go and talk to one of those priests. I'm just going to have him go bless me. So I walked up there, and the whole time he's praying over me, I'm shaking. 
I opened up my eyes and I said, thank you, Father. And I went and I sat down. I knew I thought I was fighting it. So I went over to him because he was standing off by himself. And I thought, Lord, is this the time I need to go and talk to him? Yep. So I walked over to him and I said, Father, I need to tell you something. And he said, I know. So I told him my story. And he said, yes, Beth, that was the Holy Spirit. He came to give you peace to tell you that everything was going to be okay. I said, okay, I've discerned that it was the Holy Spirit. I want to make sure that I've discerned what's with the cell phone. I want to make sure I've discerned that properly. He looked me straight in the eyes and he said, Beth, the Lord knows your prayers. And as soon as he said that, I knew what he was talking about. Because if there was ever a time I was in private prayer, in adoration, or in mass, and I was crying, it was for our son David, who had fallen away from practicing his faith. And I truly wanted him to come back to practice his faith. So I do believe the good Lord was telling me that he's had his own in his hands and he was going to bring him back. So all you St. Monica's out there, please keep praying for those children and grandchildren. Our David is back in the church. So please keep praying. A few months later, I, we got to, I got to uh, discern it with another one of the Franciscan friars. And Paul said, tell Father Anthony what happened to you. Get a second opinion. I said, is this like a doctor's office? I gotta get a second opinion? So I told Father Anthony what happened to me, and he said, okay, Beth, I need to ask you some questions. He said, did you throw yourself on the bed? I said, yes, Father, I threw myself on the bed, just out of pure exhaustion. He said, okay. He said, were you on your back or your stomach? And I had to think about it a minute, but I was on my back. He said, okay, the last question, had you stopped crying? And I had to think about it again, and I said, yes, I had stopped crying. He said, well, Beth, you had surrendered. You had given it all up. You weren't trying to control anything anymore. You truly had surrendered over to the Lord, and that's why you were able to receive. So praise God. So all those little promptings that you get in your life to do something, those are the Holy Spirit. That is the Holy Spirit. He's guiding you right where you need to be. People have asked me why I thought I bought that crucifix. I thought I was just buying a crucifix because I thought it was going to give me some peace because I saw my husband crying in his Bible. But that was the Holy Spirit prompting me. Follow those promptings in your life. And that is my message to you. Follow those promptings. Thank you. But we're very open people. You can ask any questions you want. Yes. What compelled us to write the book? What compelled us to write the book? That's a great question. <clears throat> Your Bishop Olmstead is behind that as well. So I survived this and I'm trying to process and every doctor at Mayo is telling us to write a book. You need to write a book. You need to write a book. And when you write a book, you use a doctor's name, they have to sign a legal release that it'll happen. So I go see Bishop Olmstead three weeks after the event and I thanked him for praying for me because he was a stranger. And I said, hey, Bishop Olmstead, the doc all the doctors are telling me to write a book. He didn't hesitate, he said, no. Discern six months and the Lord will give you a sign whether you're to write a book. And being an obedient person, I said, okay. So the day before my surgery, I said I was in my I love me room, my office. The last thing I did before I went to the hospital, I said I have to leave a roadmap for my children. I never ordered a Christian book on why in my life. The day before surgery, I was going through Dynamic Catholic. There's thousands of books I'm going. I don't know what to order. I did it off the title. First book was Nine Words by um, Dr. Alan Hart. What are nine words about? What if you had to live your life and you only had to memorize nine words? Fruits of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5.20. I said, that's perfect. The next book was The Mission of Your Family by John Leonetti. 
how to model your family like the Holy Family. And the third book was One Thing. What's one thing? What you teach your children and grandchildren before you die? Christ. Matthew Kelly. So I, ran, I thought I randomly ordered books from Matthew Kelly, Alan Hunt, and John Lennon. There are no coincidences. Bishop Olmsted tells me after all this happens, discern six months. It's best that we moved up to Phoenix. We go to the nearest church. Phoenix is big. Rented a house in four hours in Metropolitan Phoenix. Go to the nearest church and she goes, hey, that Dr. Alan Hunt guy's here. Uh, the book you ordered before your surgery. So I go see him and I said, hey, something happened to me. I'm discerning whether I should write a book. He goes, do you have a transcript? So I got some notes in case I dropped dead again. My kids will have some. Can I read it? Calls up the next day. He goes, Paul, that is such a powerful testimony to a living Jesus Christ. Since you've never written a book, let me introduce you to Matthew Kelly, my friend in Australia, and John Leonetti in Iowa. They'll help you. I looked at Beth and I said, wait a minute. Those are the three exact authors the day before those books I ordered. I looked at my calendar, six months. Bishop Lumsey's a prophet. I never wrote a book. So I took a pen out and I just opened the Bible to what Paul wrote. In the second, second chapter of Corinthians, he wrote, When I came to you, brethren, I did not come with any words of eloquent speech. No, I came to you with the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's all my story was about. I was on Pentecost Sunday. The power of the Spirit. So I just hand wrote that book. Um, and again, we typically find it helps people who are suffering, whether they're going to be dying soon or not, or young people with that mission statement will gravitate to, what's your purpose in life? We all have a purpose. Great question. Thank you. That's how the book came about. Yes? It's a great question. Do you have a life review experience and who was present? <clears throat> life review, could, I'll try to find, I, I use it as like an uh, examination of my conscience or I was a conscience review, illumination. He showed me my past. Um, so he showed me what, what offended him. They were my sins. Was anybody present? No. People asked me, did you see Jesus? I said, oh, no, no, no. If I would have seen Jesus, I wouldn't be standing here. It would have been over. It would have been over. They said, what do you think you saw? And we processed this with deep theologians like Archbishop Corleone came over for dinner. And he wanted to go through the story and look at the medical records. And he said, everything you shared is in conformity with the Catholic Church's teaching on death. And he said, what do you think that heat was before you died? He said, I, I don't know, being baptized in the spirit. I, doctors tell me that no human being should have survived what I under. And he said, I don't think that was a baptism by the Spirit. I think that was purgatory. You're being, that heat, you're, that you're being purged. Nothing sinful can enter God's presence. So he said, what else? I said, well, the light to me was the Holy Spirit. It was on Pentecost. It was God's love holding me while prayers were heard and actions were taken. He goes, absolutely agree with you on that one. The president of the American College of Neurosurgeons read that book and said, I need to meet Dr. Shravats and the guy who did a left stellar ganglion nerve block your brainstem. I said, why, doctor? What he did to you was a neurosurgeon's procedure. He's an EP cardiologist. Who trained him? Less than one-tenth of one percent of neurosurgeons would ever know how to do that. He could have killed you. That is one of the most risky procedures. So I see Dr. Shravats in the EP. I said, hey, Dr. Scully wanted me to ask you, who trained you to do that? The man started crying. He said, I'll never forget that day, Paul. No one. I read about it. I've done it once. When I came in that day, there was no treatment for you. And I did not treat your heart. You had Purkinje nerve damage from surgery. All I could do was stop your heart here and beat it mechanically and rest you. I didn't treat you. Oh, you're a light crowd today. I will be around to pray with you. Do anything you need, prayer intentions. Or... By the way, Bishop Olmsted has dedicated his remaining life to intercessory prayer. He prays all day. He's given us approval to give you his private email if you need prayer. May God bless you and keep you. Pray for us that uh, the Lord keeps us healthy, that we can continue our apostolate. 
God bless you all. Thank you.